I remember well when uh, the Dave Miller family and my family moved to Brown Trail. The first part of 1988, and uh, Dave became one of my all-time best friends because we officed just a few steps away from each other for 15 years. And he and I made uh, several mission trips together. We went to Jamaica together to do some mission work there. And we had a long, long flight together to South Africa uh, to do about three weeks of mission work there. And you become a well acquainted with a person uh, on a flight like that. You have time to converse with one another and share insights and ideas that we gleaned from the scriptures. This boy that's seated to my right, this man, was in the third grade when they came to Brown Trail. And so those of us who've been here a long time saw him grow up. And we knew that he was from a talented family indeed. And uh, we saw quite readily that uh, the kids were gonna follow in the footsteps of their parents because all of them have turned out well. Jeff Miller has excelled in uh, academics. Uh, he received a bachelor's degree in physical science from Fried Hardeman University, as well as a bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Texas at Arlington, and a doctoral degree in mechanical engineering from Auburn University. Jeff currently serves as the full-time science writer for, for Apologetics Press, and if you don't get that publication, you need to because it is an excellent publication, and I've tried to keep every a copy or every issue of that paper for a long, long time, and it's a wealth of information that Christians today need in order to fend off the uh, uh, unbelievers that uh, may attack God's way. Uh, he is uh, also an associate with that Apologetics Press, as well as the editor of the Teen Christian Evidences magazine. Uh, Valor and Virtue, and is the editor of the Apologetics Press Bible Class Curriculum. Uh, he has presented material on Christian evidences and on the culture war and speaking engagements across the Brotherhood. Uh, nearly every issue of Apologetics Press has where the uh, uh, members of that uh, uh, editorial board are going, are going in uh, speaking engagements and uh, they pretty well canvassed the United States in lecturing, and so we're fortunate to have him uh, here tonight. He is the author of the book Science Versus Evolution. He is married to Julie, and they have four children, Evie, Celeste, David, and Campbell. All of them are here, and uh, uh, Julie, his wife, is here, and we're grateful to have Brother Miller with us. Jeff, we love you. We're looking forward to hearing you speak on Colossians chapter 1, if you want to get your Bible out, beginning at about verse 14 for the next four or five verses. You'll, you'll enjoy hearing Jeff speak. It's a little bit ominous following Brother Edwards. You know, I sat at his feet many times at the Finger Congregation uh, while I was at Fried Hardeman University. And uh, very much enjoyed, enjoyed that. He's a brilliant man. Uh, my parents uh, wanted to be sure to, for me to send their love to you. They're sorry they're not able to be here, although they are, they are, are watching uh, through the streaming, I believe, right now. Brother Boren's right. It was, it was 27 years ago when my parents and my older, th or my older two sisters, my younger sister and I walked through those doors. Those doors haven't changed. They look exactly like that. And from that moment on, I lived in mortal dread of this pulpit. The idea of getting up here in front of so many people and messing up or being compared to my dad, who I just held so high and, and, and hold so, so high, and the idea of being a disappointment. You know, I remember after one of the lectures, one of the Fort Worth lectures uh, one evening, you know, you had uh, Bert Thompson and Wayne Jackson on that particular uh, lectureship. This was back when I was an adolescent. I remember walking out that door, and I remember my dad saying, you know, what do you think about maybe working for Apologetic Express one day? And I thought, no way. <laughs> Because you have to get up here and do this kind of stuff, and I'm just not interested in that. Just would not want to do that. And it's amazing what God will send into your life to make you do something you didn't expect to do. As we launch in here, I um, wanted to do a brief review, first of all, um, some of the material that Brother Workman actually covered yesterday morning, a little background review. It's clear from uh, Colossians 4 in verses 
3 and 10 and 18 that Paul wrote his letter to the Colossians while he was incarcerated. So notice the references to his chains and fellow prisoner. Uh, Philemon, Ephesians, and Philippians were thought to have been written during the same incarceration. So we estimate that Paul wrote his letter to the Colossians somewhere in the range of A.D. 60 to 62 while he was incarcerated in Rome the first time, awaiting trial before Caesar in the time period probably being alluded to in Acts 28, 30, and 31 after his three missionary journeys. Now we infer from chapter 1, verses 4, 7, and 8, as well as chapter 2, verse 1, that apparently Paul had never visited Colossian, uh, Colossae, never visited the Colossians. He heard of their faith. He learned about it from Epaphras. He recognized that they had not seen his face in the flesh. He had stayed in Ephesus preaching for three years, and while doing so in Acts chapter 19, verse 10 and 26, indicates that the gospel had spread throughout Asia, uh, while, uh, which would have included Colossae, which was about 120 miles east of Ephesus. So Paul wrote his letter and apparently sent it to Colossae by the hand of Tychicus, according to chapter 4, verse 7, as he did the letter to the Ephesians, again, probably at the same time, Ephesians 6.21. So Epaphras is, is mentioned twice uh, in Colossians, with the impression being given that he was responsible for uh, teaching the church at Colossae. And Paul probably taught Epaphras while in Ephesus, who then uh, perhaps went and, and possibly planted that congregation in Colossae. Now, although Paul hadn't uh, visited the church at Colossae, he got wind of some erroneous ideas that had infiltrated the church there, including the worship of angels, and most importantly, uh, the flat-out rejection by some of the deity of Christ. Now that obviously warranted a letter from Paul with some strong admonitions. So the primary message, therefore, of the letter seems to be to stress to the Colossians the supremacy of Christ over all others. There's no need for, nor should there be, any other focus or priority in life except as it relates to him. Notice Paul's words to the Ephesians, again, probably at the same time that he wrote uh, his letter to the Colossians. In chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, he wrote, Concerning God's mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You know, it might seem bizarre to us that such a statement really even needed to be, to be made because it seems uh, so obvious to the modern mind that Jesus is supreme. Uh, but clearly this was a problem that needed to be addressed in the first century at a time when Christians were surrounded by many ideas about the spiritual realm, including the, uh, the gods of Roman mythology, whose character were significantly different from the character of Christ, uh, but who were believed in by the masses. But even though it might seem unnecessary today um, for Paul to have to say such things, parallels could certainly be made today, could they, could they not? Uh, parallels that, that show that it's really not all that different today. In the same way that we might say that, that abortion today is the modern equivalent of the ancient practice of sacrificing children to Molech that we read about in the Bible. The only difference today being instead of uh, Molech, people offer their children to the God of sexual freedom and the God of freedom from consequences. And in the same way, it could easily be said that Americans today raise any number of things higher than Christ in importance, from sports, where the masses gather each week in a, in a stadium to worship instead of a building uh, that we worship in like this one, uh, entertainment, materialism, drugs, uh, even environmentalism and animal rights, sexual freedom, pluralism, and each of these things are argued to be crucial to one's happiness today. We need them, they say. Well, Paul would likely say the same things to us that he did to the Colossians and Ephesians. Christ is supreme. There's no need for uh, other, any other philosophies or priorities in life. Prioritize Christ and his teachings, and you will be happy. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. 
And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1, 15 through 20, our text of the hour. Now notice in verses 15 through 17 of our text, Paul specifically hones in on and emphasizes Christ's supremacy over creation. In verse 15, Paul makes the interesting statement that Christ is the image of the invisible God, meaning that though no one has seen God directly in his actual heavenly form, John 1.18, Jesus is a physical representation of God to man. John 14.9, he who has seen Jesus has seen uh, the Father. Hebrews 1.3, he is the express image of his person. So Jesus is physical representation of God in human form. The next phrase, much confusion and erroneous teaching has occurred uh, in the world today due to the misconception, uh, due to misunderstandings and misconceptions about biblical terms. And the, the word firstborn, which Paul uses here, is no exception. When we take our modern understanding of terms, our modern definitions, and thrust those onto biblical terms, which didn't have those meanings in the first century, then we're destined to misunderstand the message of a passage. And sometimes give ammo to skeptics who wish to discredit Scripture and maybe even create new religions based off of those false ideas, as has been the case with the Jehovah's Witnesses. So does, does the term firstborn mean that Christ is not eternal, that he is a created being, that he came into being as God's son at some point in the same way that a firstborn child comes into existence at conception? Was Jesus created just like us and therefore as the Jehovah's Witnesses believe he's not God? Well, we do use the term firstborn today to mean the first of our children, but the term was not only used in that sense by the Jews. To the Jews, it could refer to one's high rank or supremacy over others. So notice, for example, the psalmist's use of the term in Psalm 89, verse 27. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So firstborn in this passage is the equivalent of saying that David would be treated with honor and favor like the firstborn son in a family was, treated as the highest and most supreme king of the earth. So understanding that Paul's goal in this book is to emphasize the supremacy of Christ, it makes perfect sense that Paul would be using the term firstborn in that very way. In fact, we might predict that the term would likely show up somewhere in the book in a book whose message is to uh, emphasize the supremacy of a being. And of course, Paul used it twice in this book in reference to Christ. Verse 18 further verifies that that's precisely how Paul is using the term, that in all things he may have the preeminence or superiority, not over some things, but all things. And he notes, even over death itself. He's the only one to have been raised from the dead, never to die again. He has supremacy over death. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. So he's the image or physical representation of God, firstborn, supreme over all creation. Verse 15, why? For or because he created it. Now that makes him, that makes him su supreme, the supreme being or God of the universe. You know, it's easy to think uh, think back to the creation week and notice that, that God is mentioned as having created the universe in Genesis 1-1. The Holy Spirit is mentioned as hovering over the face of the water, verse 2. According to this passage, as well as John 1-3, Hebrews 1-2, Jesus was the one through whom the universe was actually created. He was there in Genesis 1 doing the work. John 1-3, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. So Jesus is supreme over the created order. Now, Paul's words in this verse uh, catch my attention, particularly as a creation scientist. The supremacy of Christ through what we see in creation. Not only does the fact that the universe was created at all indicate the supremacy of its creator, but the more that we dig in and study the details of the created order, the more we're forced to admit that whoever created it is even more supreme than we thought. And we can see he's omnipotent and perhaps in an even more recognizable way as we study creation, we see that he's omniscient, he's all-knowing. Jesus created the universe and interestingly we find uh, from Paul's statements in chapter, uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 that we can come to know 
that a creator exists through science, through the study of the universe. God's creation is, is what we might call God's general or natural revelation to man, as opposed to his special revelation through the Bible. We can know God exists through his creation. And beyond that, Paul informs us that we can even learn something about the nature of the creator through the study of his creation. I find that fascinating. Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without his without excuse. So his existence, his divinity, his omnipotence can be seen through his creation. And there's no doubt that we can learn of his omniscience, his supremacy over knowledge. Now from an engineering perspective, the planning and purpose and wisdom that went into every intricacy of nature, in my opinion, is simply stunning. Let's look at one, one little example here for a moment. The system in your body that controls your temperature is what we call the thermoregulatory system. And the entire temperature system is controlled, as you might suspect, by the brain. The processing center in the brain that controls the biothermal system is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is basically your thermostat for your body's air conditioning system. It controls this thermoregulatory system. The body uses temperature sensors. They're like thermometers or thermocouples in engineering. These are called thermoreceptors, and they're located throughout the human body, and they read the temperature wherever they are. So there's these thermoreceptors in the hypothalamus, they're in the skin, they're in the bladder, they're in your eyes, and the thermoreceptors that are in your skin are the peripheral nerves, and they can detect changes in temperature, external temperature. So temperature changes in the air, and the thermoreceptors in the hypothalamus actually can detect changes in blood temperature. And from that information, the hypothalamus is able to adjust your body's thermal regulatory functions by using what we call effector nerves. And these are kind of like power lines that are used to communicate with various parts of your body to initiate various kinds of thermal responses, which in turn affect the heat loss in your body. Very sophisticated system showing design and intent, not random accidents. Now, one small, often neglected, but I think amazing part of your temperature system is the bladder's detrusor muscle. Now there are thermal receptors in the bladder, sensors that are taking the temperature of the liquid in the bladder. They send that temp temperature data up to the hypothalamus using those power lines of communication, the effector nerves. And as the temperature of the bladder drops due to it being getting cold, the bladder cooling reflex is triggered in the hypothalamus and the message is sent to the detrusor muscle on the bladder telling it to contract. And that detrusor contraction makes you feel the need to go to the bathroom, thus eliminating that cool water from your body and keeping your body's temperature regulated. Now think about this. How could a system like that happen by accident, really? And how could someone have the knowledge to come up with a system like that? The muscle, the sensors, the nerves connecting the bladder all the way to the hypothalamus? They all had to be planned out. They had to be intact and working in working order from the very beginning. How helpful would an effector nerve that only went halfway between the brain and the bladder be? How, how helpful would that be? So this mechanism shows decisive design and planning and intent. In biblical terms, it shows knowledge and wisdom and understanding and a lot of it. When we look at this without bias, that's clear, it's common sense, it's logical. What about piloerection? This is a scientist's fancy way of saying goosebumps. This is an amazing feature, I believe, of the thermoregulatory system. Thermoreceptors in the skin are constantly reading the temperature of the air, sending that information up to the hypothalamus. And when the temperature readings from, from some of those thermoreceptors are low enough, then the hypothalamus makes the decision to send a message back to those areas just where the cold temperature was detected by those receptors. Now, muscles are attached at the base of each hair follicle, and uh, the hypothalamus's message tells those muscles to contract. And that contraction generates some interior heat, which helps with warmth. More importantly, it also raises those hairs. Why in the world would that happen? Well, the raised hairs actually catch heat that's being released by the body and creates what we call a thermal mat a heat pillow between the cold air and your skin. And the opposite happens when you get hot. The hairs are actually lowered. Now what's more, have you ever noticed that goosebumps only pop up where they're needed? The hypothalamus doesn't just send a generic message to all of the hairs in your body telling them all to stand up like a goosebump on an off switch. The hypothalamus is able to pinpoint the localized area where the temperature is cold and only raise those hairs that need to be raised. 
And then there's skin pore size, also playing a role in heat retention. When the surrounding temperature drops and your hypothalamus gives the command to generate goosebumps, the skin pores for each hair decrease at the same time, so the pore sizes are smaller, thus allowing for less heat loss through those holes. Now again, we have to keep asking the question, how could something like that just happen randomly? Piloerection shouts out design. You know, it's, it's fascinating to consider that all such created things were planned out and created by Christ, the supreme creator. It's interesting to think about Christ in that way, who's omniscient and omnipotent. The natural order is simply stunning. And I'm not alone in that belief by far. One area of engineering that's growing by leaps and bounds across the world is what we call biomimicry, as well as bio-inspired engineering. Biomimicry is where engineers use nature as a blueprint and try to copy it. The webpage for George Washington University's Center for Biomimetics and Bioinspired Engineering says, however, despite our seeming prowess in these, in these component technologies, we find it hard to outperform nature in this arena. Nature solutions are smarter, more energy efficient, agile, adaptable, fault tolerant, environmentally friendly, and multifunctional. Thus, there is much that we as engineers can learn from nature as we develop the next generation machines and technologies. In other words, nature is well engineered, so much so that the top engineering minds look to, look to it to try to uh, determine what their design should be. Now, these engineers would hardly be considered friendly to creationists. But this kind of mindset is becoming widespread in the engineering community. Engineers simply stand in awe of the designs that are evident in nature. For example, engineers are more and more coming to the realization that insects function amazingly well, especially considering that their brains carry less than 0.01% as many neurons as do human brains. So their ability to maneuver, especially in the air, is an unequaled engineering feat. Uh, and one of the insect features that engineers have recently discovered is that many insects are equipped with a sophisticated engineering sensor that helps the insect to keep track of its orientation and stay upright as it's flying. Ocelli are small eyes located on, the, on various kinds of insects eyes that are in addition to the larger compound eyes that we can see more easily on insects and therefore we usually think of as the insect's eyes. The compound eyes are associated with insect vision, but many insects also have these ocelli in addition to their compound eyes. Engineers believe that these ocelli are horizon sensors dedicated to that purpose, locating the horizon to help the insect keep track of its orientation in flight. So with these ocelli in mind, engineers are starting to try to mimic these horizon sensors in the design of aerial vehicles. Engineers from Caltech and Australian National University in association with NASA have designed a biomorphic uh, ocellus mimicking the ocelli of dragonflies in order to help achieve an improved flight stabilization system for aerial vehicles. Now, when engineers engage in this type of design, they are acknowledging the awesomeness of the natural realm and the presence of design in the universe, whether or not they mean to. You know, it's, it's not enough to just say, well, evolution just accidentally caused those things to happen and be perfected over millions of years. You can't say that. Darwinian evolution doesn't have the, the ability to design horizon sensors on the head of a dragonfly. Evolution doesn't have a mind. A creator that's supreme over the engineering community is required. Another example, have you ever put your hand out the window as you drove down the interstate and felt the effect of the wind on your hand? You ever done that? Maybe you, you tilted your hand in different ways to, to observe uh, the various ways that the wind affects your hand. As you tilted it, you probably noticed that your, your hand lifts at different speeds based on the angle of the tilt. Now this is the same principle that's used in helicopter and wind uh, turbine blades. Now you may have noticed that if you tilted your hand too far or the wind hit it in a funny way, it would no longer lift your hand, but it would make it drop or throw it in a funny way. That's a type of stalling and it can be a major problem for devices that use blades, but some scientists have realized that humpback whales don't have this problem. They can tilt their fins at aggressive angles as they swim without this stalling problem happening and without creating too much drag, which allows them to change their depth and their orientation in the water really quickly so that they can actually catch fast prey. So engineers went to trying to work and figure out what's allowing this kind of maneuvering and what they found is amazing. Notice on the fin of this, this humpback whale that there are bumps 
funny little ridges that we call tubercles. Here's another picture. Scientists at a company known as Whale Power, located in Toronto, Canada, figured out that these tubercles have something to do with the maneuverability of the whale although engineers don't even totally understand what's going on yet. Well, the company published work in 2004 showing that blades or fins designed with bumps like the tubercles on a humpback whale uh, fin, they push that stall angle on blades back by as much as 40%. And the new blade design is reported by popular mechanics to increase the annual production of electrical power for wind farms by 20%. So can anyone honestly deny that the universe is equipped with superior design features? that an omniscient being must have designed the infinite number of sophisticated entities in the universe. Engineers still don't even totally understand what these tubercles uh, are, how they work in the effective way that they do. So to claim that such a feature could just happen by accident without a purpose in mind like atheistic evolution suggests is simply ridiculous. Again, a supreme being, a supreme engineer is logically demanded by the evidence. Another example, you probably heard about the camera and its many similarities to the human eye. The Time Life Science Library series volume on the body said the eye operates on the same principle as the camera, the only machine directly modeled on a sense organ. So the camera was a product of biomimicry. It was actually designed by studying the design of the eye. Now what you might not have heard about is the latest engineering research, which is taking the camera a step further. Engineers realize that the eye is, is simply amazing. Regular cameras simply aren't as effective. So to try to improve on the camera, they're now trying to mimic the size and even the shape of the human eye rather than just the inner workings of the eye, which are still an object of bewilderment to scientists. Scientists at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and Northwestern University have developed a camera that mimics the curves of the human retina. So the camera shown on the screen here looks like the human eye in its shape. So what did engineers find upon designing a camera that mimics the human eye? Well, they found that this new camera can take wide-angled pictures without distortion, just like the human eye can. Now again, how in the world could anyone honestly say that such a thing could happen by chance? There is clear evidence of design and purpose and intent in the human eye, qualities which indicate the presence of a designer, a mind behind the product, and an om omniscient one at that. And Jesus was the creator of that fantastic organ. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Proverbs 20 and verse 12, the hearing, eye and the, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. The more we study creation, the more we're forced to admit that its engineer, Jesus, is supreme. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. And he is God. Some groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses deny that the Bible even teaches the divinity of Christ. They argue that the Bible has been corrupted over the years. It didn't originally claim that Jesus is God. Their literature even makes uh, what they call corrections to the text and make it say what they believe it should say in order to stay in harmony with their beliefs. They do this without evidence of textual variants that would provide them with that evidence. Instead, they do this merely because they have a different belief than what the Bible teaches. But attempts to strip Jesus of his deity by rewriting passages in the Bible are difficult because there's just too many of them. And again, textual variants overwhelmingly indicate that there's no issue with the text that we have. The Bible's too clear on the matter. For example, Isaiah 9, 6, the Messiah would be called Mighty God and Everlasting Father. The whole theme of the entire book of John is to highlight the deity of Christ. John 1, John 8, John 20. Jesus accepted worship. The worship is only to be directed at God. Matthew 4, Acts 10, Revelation 22, Revelation 19. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, which his audience, the Jews, understood that meant to mean that he was equating himself with God, according to John chapter 10 and John chapter 19. And of course, in Paul's own writings, Jesus' deity is expressed in numerous ways. Here in Colossians 1, Jesus is said to be the express image of God, verse 15, embodying the fullness of deity, verse 19. In the next chapter, Paul expounds on that very idea, spelling out for us what he meant, that the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in Christ's body. And also in this text, Paul highlights Jesus' supremacy over creation, verse 15, his omnipotence, verse 16, and even his eternality, verse 17. 
Paul says that uh, says Christ is before all things. Well, what things? Well, the things he just mentioned. Everything that was created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. John 1, 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. He created everything. He existed before all things in heaven and on earth. Well, then, logically... If he was before all created things, he couldn't have been created. He is eternal along with the Father. I think it's noteworthy to consider that Paul uses he is, the third person form of I am, in repetitious list-like fashion in these verses, verses 15, 17, and 18. And in each case, he highlights a quality of Christ's divinity. It would surely be difficult for Paul's audience to miss the subtle reminders of Jesus' I am statements uh, that he made multiple times throughout his ministry, statements that's, that seem to clearly point his audience back to God's discussion uh, with Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3, when God told Moses that his name is I Am. So Jesus is the I Am. He's supreme over creation. Now in verse 17, Paul says that in Christ all things consist. Other translations say all things hold together. In other words, he actually sustains the created order, the universe. Order is kept by Christ who does not allow chaos to reign in the physical realm. Hebrews 1.3 describes Christ as upholding all things by the word of his power. Who else but a supreme being could actually maintain cohesion and order in the entire universe by any means, much less by mere words. Think about that, mere words. In him all things consist, implies deity and supremacy. This is another verse which surely catches many creation scientists' attention. By Christ, all things hold together. By his word, everything is upheld. When I think about that, I can't help but be reminded of what we call the laws of science that hold the universe together and provide structure. Hidden power that we describe as rules that govern the universe, that have been discovered over the centuries, which give the universe order. Gravity, for example, literally holds things together. Even the most famous of atheists stand in awe of these powers that maintain the universe. Famous atheist, theoretical physicist, and cosmologist of Cambridge University, Stephen Hawking, he hosted a show on Discovery Channel back in 2011 where he slammed theism, promoted atheism, and in that show, he said the universe is a machine governed by principles or laws, laws that can be understood by the human mind. I believe that the discovery of these laws has been humankind's greatest achievement. But what's really important is that these physical laws, as well as being unchangeable, are universal. They apply not just to the flight of the ball, but to the motion of a planet and everything else in the universe. Unlike laws made by humans, the laws of nature cannot ever be broken. That's why they're so powerful. The laws of nature are fixed. The existence of the laws and the unwavering nature of those laws of nature catch the attention of scientists. The strength that would be required to do such a thing is staggering. Cosmic evolution, which is the Big Bang coupled with Darwinian evolution, that by its very nature is chaotic. Everything that happens is random and it's not ordered, which would have to be the case if there is no mind involved in the universe. But order and structure indicates planning and intent. It indicates purpose in a mind. In his book, The Grand Design, Hawking said, these laws should hold everywhere and at all times, otherwise they wouldn't be laws. There could be no exceptions. They're so powerful and crucial to science and even more to the existence of the universe that Hawking and other naturalists can't help but try to figure out how the universe could be explained in such a way that the laws wouldn't be violated. In the literature, they're constantly trying to figure out ways to get around, for example, the law of biogenesis to explain how life could emerge from non-life. Hawking especially is on the hunt to try to figure out how the cosmic egg that he believes exploded in the hypothetical Big Bang, how it could have come into existence without violating the first law of thermodynamics. They know they just can't ignore the laws of nature. They have to figure out how uh, to make naturalism possible without violating those laws. But the ironic thing is that even if the naturalists could find a way around the laws of nature to try to explain the universe in a natural way, they still have to answer how the laws of nature exist in the first place. Why do the laws of science even exist? Where did they come from? Who wrote them? Without a lawmaker, how could they even exist? Humanist Martin Gardner wrote a few years ago, 
Imagine that physicists finally discover all the basic waves and their particles and all the basic laws and unite everything in one equation. We can then ask, why that equation? And why are there quantum laws? There's no escape from the super ultimate questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? And why is the something structured the way that it is? Why does the universe operate the way that it does? Uh, through regularities that we call laws that uphold the universe. What is that underlying power and direction that tells that power what to do? Why are there specific equations and specific numbers that describe how things work? Equations, by definition, are not random. They indicate structure and design and intent and planning. They indicate a mind. Those kinds of words can't be used to describe random chance processes and chaos, which are words that describe evolution. Someone had to write the laws for the universe to follow. Now, Stephen Hawking believes that quantum mechanics could create a universe from nothing before the supposed Big Bang happened, which he also believes in. But again, even if the Big Bang were true and the evidence stands against that, you can see our website at apologeticexpress.org for a lot of material on that subject, Hawking himself still had to ask the questions. Did God create the quantum laws that allowed the Big Bang to occur? In a nutshell, did we need a God to set it all up so that the Big Bang could bang? Now his stubborn answer was no. But the problem is he couldn't provide answers to those questions. He couldn't even attempt an explanation. And yet he still flat out rejects the idea of a God whose existence would actually give him a reasonable answer to the problem, revealing his own bias against God and his lack of objectivity and, scientific, and his unscientific approach to the question of God. How could a law of nature exist without a law writer? Another famous atheist, a theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and astrobiologist of Arizona State University, Paul Davies, he responded to Hawking's contention about the universe creating itself. And he noted that Hawking asked this very question, but then that Hawking backed away from it without giving an answer. And yet the whole point of the show that Hawking uh, made that comment on was to show the audience how the whole question of the existence of the universe has been answered through natural science and we don't need God anymore. But they don't have an answer to that most basic question. Paul Davies said in response to Hawking, you need to know where those laws come from. That's where the mystery lies, the laws. They don't have an answer because you can't have a law without a law writer. The existence of the laws of science are proof that God exists and that naturalistic evolution is inadequate in its attempt to harmonize with the actual evidence. Now, while the naturalistic model doesn't have a reasonable explanation for several critical points in the universe, the creation model is perfectly in harmony with the evidence. While atheistic models can't explain the origin of the laws of science, guess which model can? Guess which model has a rational explanation? Long before the laws of thermodynamics were formally articulated in, eight, in the 1850s, long before the law of biogenesis was formally proven by Pasteur in uh, 1864, the laws of science were written. You know, in the last few chapters of the book of Job, recall that God made a speech to Job humbling him with the knowledge that Job knew essentially nothing in comparison with God, who knows everything, he created everything in the universe. Now, two of the, the humbling questions that God asked Job were, do you know the ordinances or the laws of the heavens? Can you set their dominion or rule over the earth? These are rhetorical questions. The obvious answer was, no, sir. That's the, I couldn't write those laws. I don't even understand them. You need a supreme being for something like that. I don't even know the first thing about that. Implied in the questions is the fact that the laws of science were written by God. So, of course, you would expect them to be in harmony with the creation model. In the same way that a poem requires a poet, a law requires a law writer. And atheism, naturalism can give no explanation for their existence, which leaves a supernatural explanation, which is in harmony with what we teach in the Bible. Scientists spend a lot of time trying to figure out what will happen if we do certain things? What will be the effect of this cause or that cause? And we might look at a cricket and we, and we study what's happening in its little body. And we might, we might look at a star and figure out you know, uh, where it is and what it's doing. We might look at the aftermath of a volcano or a flood and study what it did to the earth and how it affected the geologic strata. But, but notice that whatever a scientist studies, all he's ultimately answering is what is happening, what happened, what will happen. The underlying ultimate question of why these things behave the way they do is left unanswered. Why the universe operates in the way that it does. We know that gravity pulls objects with less mass towards objects with more mass. Why? 
What about the physical realm causes behavior like that? Why are there these regularities or laws of behavior? Well, it appears that the ultimate answer lies beyond the physical realm. The answer lies in the spiritual realm where the supreme creator rules. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the water of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep and storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Christ reigns from the spiritual realm, upholding the universe with mere words and power. Power that we can't even see, that cannot be empirically tested that results in the order and structure that we see in the universe, that literally holds things together, a profound concept. Jesus is certainly supreme. As we wrap up our brief look at this text, notice that after finishing highlighting Christ's supremacy over creation, Paul continues by highlighting Christ's supremacy over the church as its head. The church is his Matthew 16, 18, he paid for it with his blood, Acts 20, 28. So naturally he has supreme authority over it. And therefore, logically, we have no authority over the church to modify it, to control it, except where Christ has delineated permission to us to do so. By Christ's shedding of his blood, he's allowed reconciliation, peace to be made between man and God, allowing us to be brought near to him, Ephesians 2, 13, after being separated from him by our sins, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And that, of course, is good news to us, isn't it? Good news. The supreme ruler of the universe, Jesus Christ, the divine, eternal ruler of creation, the church, and even death, saw fit to notice lowly, sinful human beings, mere bacteria in comparison to him, and give us an avenue to live in eternal bliss with him. I think that's amazing. Why in the world would we need any other than Jesus? He is supreme. If you're not a member of the Lord's Church, we encourage you to become one in simple faith, turning from your sins in repentance, confessing Christ with your mouth, being immersed in water for the remission of your sins, being added to the one church of the Bible where you must remain faithful to the end in order to receive a crown of life, Revelation 2.10. If you have a need to do that tonight, we encourage you to come forward now while we stand and sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. (laughs) 